Please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 87. Psalm 87. The song the Lord wants us to sing in our hearts. On the holy mount stands the city he founded. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things of you are spoken, O city of God. Among those who know me, I mention Rahab and Babylon. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Cush. This one was born there, they say. And of Zion it shall be said, This one and that one were born in her. For the Most High himself will establish her. The Lord records as he registers the peoples, this one was born there. Singers and dancers alike say, all my springs are in you. All our life comes from God. Thus far the reading of Psalm 87. Please turn now in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. The Lord here speaking through his holy apostle, the Apostle Paul. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Let's pray together. God our Father, you sent your living word, your son, into our world. You sent the Holy Spirit to inscripturate your word written for your people. And we are now assembled before you this morning, asking that you would please open our ears, that we would hear Christ speaking to us this morning. Open our eyes that we might behold him in all of his grace and glory. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We come in Jesus' name. Amen. In 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, while Paul was forced to defend his ministry from attacks by false teachers, he lists the various trials and hardships and sufferings that he experienced in his labors for the churches. And he concludes it in an interesting way by saying in verse 28, apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Now I only have one church to care for, yet the pressure and anxiety is no less real. You don't turn it on at nine in the morning and turn it off at five. So one thing I do to cope with that pressure, to find some relief from that pressure, is that I read mystery stories. You see, at the heart of a mystery story is a problem that needs to be solved. And that engages my mind. And then there's the context of the mystery story. I like medieval and historical mysteries. So your mind, my mind gets taken to another world, another place, another time. And so I can relax just a little bit. From the Hardy Boys and Happy Hollisters when I was a boy, to Sherlock Holmes and Miss Marple, Brother Cadfile, and Billy Boyle, mysteries both engage my mind and allow me to relax. But today, now, in our text, we come back full circle. For in a letter that is specifically focused by Paul on his care for the churches, he speaks of the mystery of Christ and of the gospel. I guess I can never really fully get away, even a mystery, for there is mystery to the gospel. There is a mystery of Christ. The word mystery is actually used 27 times in the New Testament. And of those 27 times, 21, roughly three quarters, a little bit over three quarters, are used by the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul himself, of those 21 times, six times are used in the one book of Ephesians. And three of those six times are used in the beginning of chapter three. So this morning we are going to explore this mystery of Christ, this mystery of the gospel. But as we do, it is important to note the distinctive use of the word mystery in the Bible and in the ancient world in which the Bible was written. For us, a mystery is an unknown problem that needs to be solved, something we need to apply our minds to in an effort to get our hands wrapped around it. But in the Bible, in the biblical world, a mystery was not an unknown problem which humans need to solve. Rather, as one dictionary puts it, a mystery is the unmanifested or private counsel of God, too profound for human ingenuity, which thus can only be known when God reveals it. A mystery is not a problem that, that has to be solved. A mystery is something of God which he must reveal if we are to know it. It is a divine reality waiting to be revealed rather than a human conundrum needing to be solved. So what does our text tell us about the gospel mystery? 
Well, Paul first in our text highlights the personal significance of the gospel mystery. The personal significance of the gospel mystery. Notice in verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. This opening verse immediately presents us with a problem. From our perspective, according to our understanding of mystery, there's something that needs to be solved because, you see, there's no verb here. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. Now, a few have proposed that really the, the verb is an, a, a hidden verb, one that's to be understood from the context. But then the question is, where do you place the verb? And on which side of the verb do you put what nouns and other nouns? And depending on which hidden verb you choose and where you put it, it can change quite a bit the meaning of the text. But if we look a little bit further, we see it, it's not quite so complex as that. Most have come to recognize that Verse 1 here is not a mystery because of the missing verb. In verse 14, the answer comes. It's an interrupted prayer. Paul is about to pray, and he gets distracted as he starts to pray. But we see in verse 14, he repeats, For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. He was about to pray for the Ephesians based on the things he had just told them about how amazing God is in what he has done to reconcile us to himself and then to one another in the church. It's an interrupted prayer. You see, what Paul has been talking about in chapter 2 is not some abstract, esoteric, philosophical gobbledygook in order to impress you with his wisdom, with his sophistry. But rather it is something out of his heart, something real, something personal, which drives him to serious prayer. The prayer uh, in one sense, can't be delayed. It needs to happen, but he has this personal concern for the Ephesians. The mystery of the gospel is vital and personal for each one who hears and responds to it. Paul is not spouting off to impress the people and how sophisticated. In the Greek world, preaching was their primary means of entertainment. And preachers would go about, we see this especially in the letters to the Corinthians where reference is made to which preacher are people going to listen to and what is it that draws people to listen. And the fact that it is only if you can get money from your listeners that shows how good of a preacher you really are according to the culture around them. Paul is not trying to simply make them feel good with flowery words or impress how intelligent he is. No, what he is saying is so personally compelling and significant for the reader that he is driven to pray. He wants to pause and pray. This needs to be true for you and me as well. Faith is not a game. The gospel is not a theological contest where we somehow prove our religion is better than someone else's. It's something very personal that 
should drive us to prayer. We see this not simply because Paul here has begun to pray, we have an interrupted prayer here, but we see this also in Paul as a passionate prayer. Paul as a passionate prayer. He doesn't say, not for this reason I pray for you and go on to what his prayer is. He says, for this reason I, Paul, a prisoner for Jesus Christ, he reveals his heart even in the act of beginning to pray. He says, for this reason, I, a personal pronoun, an emphatic personal pronoun. I, Paul, he gives his name. It's him. He is the one who is praying. He is the one who cares. A prisoner for Jesus Christ. There are personal circumstances that come to him because of the very gospel that he has been preaching. More literally, the Greek says a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Here he, in one sense, highlights his personal relationship to Christ. That is more important to him than the Roman chains that bind him. But rather it's his Christ-oriented compulsion. Even though he is truly a prisoner for Christ, it was the gospel that caused the preaching of the gospel that led to his imprisonment. He sees himself as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He belongs to Christ. He's his prisoner to do whatever he commands. And what he commands is finally, on behalf of you Gentiles. On behalf of you Gentiles. Paul is for them. What he's doing, what he's preaching is for them. For them who were previously alienated, as he says in chapter 2, verse 12, separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But he is praying for them on behalf of them. What's interesting is up to this point in chapter 3, there is virtually no personal content other than his name and his position as an apostle, which are the very first words of the letter to identify who's writing it. Now, this is different from most of his other letters where he shares a lot more personal interchange back and forth about himself as well as about the church to which he is writing, which is one of the reasons that it seems that this letter was not just to the church at Ephesus, but was meant to be a circular letter to churches over the entire region. And so he doesn't speak so personally. But now having spoken of Christ reconciling us to God in, in chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, and of Christ breaking the wall between Jew and Gentile and bringing the people together as one new man in him and bringing us to God in verses 11 and tw through 22 of chapter 2, he can't help but reveal his personal concern. His personal concern. The gospel brings forth his personal concern. It's not just religious ritual for him. It's not just checking off a religion box that in order to be acceptable in society, you need to have a certain aura of religion about you. 
There is a personal concern in the gospel. It is important to recognize the personal significance of the gospel mystery. Next, we note the providential stewardship of this gospel mystery. In verse 2, he goes on and he gets distracted, talking about himself as a prisoner of Christ for the Gentiles. That distracts him for a moment. He says, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I've written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. The gospel ministry of Jesus was not something of his own speculation or his own initiative. It was not that he was looking for another side job and decided he needed to come up with something new in order to attract people and earn a little bit more money. No, this was a providential stewardship. God gave this to him for the Gentiles. We see that his ministry of the gospel ministry was first promoted by grace from God. That's what he's saying in verse 2. That you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. It came from God. He, he didn't do this on his own. God has given this. He's not earning his position by hard labor and merit. But it is something that was given graciously to him from God for the churches and the people. It was not given for self-promotion, but it was given for you to benefit and bless those to whom he was unveiling this mystery. Indeed, not only was it not his own initiative, in fact, not only was it promoted by grace from God, but it was prompted by a revelation from God. In verse 3, he goes on to say, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. The mystery was made known to me by revelation. Paul was not a doctoral student having to come up with something entirely new in order to make his dissertation topic acceptable to the scholars in the land. This was not something new. It was revealed to him by God when Christ appointed him as an apostle and called him on the road to Damascus, redirecting the course of his entire life. His life was thereafter changed. It was never the same again. He went from being a persecutor of the church to being a promoter of the church, the gospel, the apostle to the Gentiles. We read him explaining how this happened in Acts chapter 26. Verses 12 to 18. When he was before Agrippa, he says in verse 12, In this connection I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me 
unto those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. This was not something he dreamed up on his own. God, by direct revelation, called him. He blinded him to get his attention. He spoke to him from heaven. He gave a new direction to his life. Forget Damascus. Forget putting Christians in prison. You're going to call people to me, even from among the Gentiles. Now he says... Here, at the end of verse 3, as I have written briefly, the question is, well, when did he write briefly? Well, he, he's talking about what he just wrote. Verse 1, for this reason, what I just said about the mystery of the gospel, of Christ coming and reconciling us to God, of Christ breaking the barriers. He's saying, in reading this, this is the content of this revelation. It's, I've already told you the content of this mystery. And not only was it promoted by grace and prompted by revelation, but it is published for blessing. Verse 4, he says, when you read this, and of course, and normally they would read the letters aloud in the synagogue. And so as they're standing here, and, and it's just been read, and now he says, when you read this, having just heard it, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. The intent of his providential stewardship of gospel mystery was that they themselves would both perceive it and receive it, that it would no longer be unknown, but it would be the mystery revealed, the mystery revealed by God. Well, he's been talking about this mystery talking about his personal significance of it and his providential stewardship of it. But now he speaks finally of the particular substance of the gospel mystery. In verse 5 and 6, he says, this mystery was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, and as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. First, he highlights the unique perspective of the gospel mystery. It was not understood in the Old Testament era. He says, it was not made known to the sons of men in other generations. But it is now revealed by divine inspiration. He goes on to say, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets, by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come and has used the apostles to bring a direct revelation from God about His Son, about their salvation. And as the apostles began to spread the word, God also raised up prophets to help explain and unfold to the congregations the meaning of those words because the letters were uh, 
They didn't have the internet where they could post it and everyone read it at once. They, a letter would go to one city, one church, and then it would have to be passed along. But as it was passed along, there would be the prophets that were supporting the work of the apostles and explaining and reminding them of what God has made known in his son. Now, the uniqueness of the gospel was not that salvation would come from the Jews. They already understood that. Indeed, that was, they almost understood it to a fault. They were so proud of being the people of God that they looked down on everyone else. But the uniqueness was not either that the Gentiles would obtain salvation. The very beginning of the promise to Abraham was that in him, all the nations of the world would be blessed. The servant of Isaiah was going to be a light to the Gentiles. That was understood, albeit how narrowly. And nor was the uniqueness of the gospel missed that God was going to send his Messiah. The, the Old Testament scripture was looking forward to the Messiah, the coming of the Savior. They were looking for that son, that son of David that would sit on the throne forever, that son of Abraham. All the pieces were there. The clues were there for the gospel mystery, but it took the coming of of the Christ to make the pieces all fit together. You see, what they could not grasp on their own, but needed God to push them over the hump, was to see that the Messiah was not just sent by God as God's Savior. The Messiah was God himself come to save them in human flesh. This was revealed to the apostles and proclaimed by the apostles and the prophets. Remember that historic day when Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Peter responded, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. The Christ, the Son of the living God, God himself, come in the flesh. And he came in the flesh, not just to save the Jews, not just to make salvation possible for the Gentiles, but to break down every barrier between Jew and Gentile that they alike would be saved as one new man before God. No longer would the Gentiles have to become Jews, but rather as they came into Christ, they would be saved on an equal basis. And this was astounding. Because the Jews knew they were called, they were chosen, they were elect. But it took Jesus to bring the unique perspective of the mystery of salvation. The good news that God had finally come to save his people. But it was not just that unique perspective of the gospel mystery that needed to be revealed. It was the unitive power of the gospel mystery. It's not so easy to see in the English text, but in verse 6, when he says this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise. Each one of those words is what you can call a with word. The prefix in Greek, sun, which means with, 
starts off each one of those words. So you get hit with this with, heirs with, members with, partakers with. They're getting hammered that it's all about being together with the Gentiles and the Jews. They're, first of all, fellow heirs. Paul, you'll remember in Romans 8, chapter 17, says that we are heirs with Christ. Well, here Paul is saying that Jews and Gentiles are heirs with one another, with Christ. They have a right to receive a blessing from Christ. They're heirs together with Christ. One another. But the thing about heirs, you see, is that even slaves sometimes were left something from a rich master. I mean, to be an heir is a privileged position. And so he drives it even deeper. They're not only heirs with, but they're members with. Members of the same body. This, in fact, word had never existed in the history of the world until Paul wrote this letter. It's found in no other document. It only is found in other writings long after this letter was written. He's trying to emphasize how equal Jew and Gentile, they're, they're one body. He's not just talking about the members of the Jewish church being one body, but Jew and Gentile together are, are one body before God. Paul takes this word with and puts it to a word body, with body, one, one with body, together, in order to emphasize the complete Unity. The Gentiles were not second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. They were equally part of it together. There are no second-class citizens in the church. It doesn't matter what your cultural background, your economic background. From God's perspective, there is no ordering. There's no ranking. We all come on an equal basis. Friends, that's good news. That is good news. And then, thirdly, he says, we are partakers with, partakers of the promise. Here he's referring to the promise to Abraham that was so strong in the Jewish mind that God would give his people his blessing. And he's saying that promise now is to be seen not just as a Jewish promise, but the promise of all God's people, Jew or Gentile. You see, there, there is no caste system in the church. There's no caste system. Gentile and Jew together, if they believe in Christ, are one new man in salvation. One new man. Inextricably connected to one another. You, you can't separate yourself out because it is as that one new man that we are saved. That's the good news of the gospel. That Christ has come to die for sinners. To unite us to himself. But in uniting us to himself, he unites us to one another. And when at the end of verse 6, he says, In Christ Jesus, through the gospel, both of those prepositional phrases are intended to apply to all of the three with words. It is because we are in Christ. That is the sphere of our salvation. We're not just saved out on our own. We are saved in Christ. 
We have been joined by faith to him. That is the sphere of our salvation. And through the gospel, that is the means of our salvation. As the good news of God coming in Christ to die for sinners, to unite us to himself and to one another. That is how. That's how we're saved. That's the wonderful mystery of the gospel. We don't save ourselves. It's not because we're of a certain heritage. It's because God has done what we could not do ourselves. This gospel mystery has personal significance. It has a providential stewardship for those who believe. You'll remember the man filled with demons, and he said, what should I, can I follow you? Jesus said, no, go home and tell your family what God has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Now, we have been given a stewardship to receive the gospel mystery is to have a stewardship of the gospel mystery. And then the particular substance, it is Christ. Christ, who alone can reconcile us to God as the God-man. Christ, who has broken the barrier between Jew and Gentile to make one new person. Right now in our culture, there is so much strife, so much bitterness between people, especially between white people and black people or people of color. And so much money is being offered and so much programming is being proposed as how do we overcome all these barriers. Friends, the only place where real unity, where real equality, real acceptance will happen is in the church because only in Christ are our sins truly dealt with. Only in Christ are the barriers of sin that keep us from God and from one another. Only in Christ can they be overcome. But because they are overcome in Christ, they ought to be seen as overcome in his people. None of us are better than anyone else. The cross is the great equalizer. Doesn't matter what your skin color is, what your economic background or status is. We're all sinners needing grace. Grace from a God who himself came into the world to save us. The mystery has been revealed. And it's always exciting when a mystery is revealed. You get to the end of the story and, and, and now you see how all these different pieces that didn't make sense, now they're suddenly put together. And there's a special joy and zeal if you figured it out in advance. Have you ever done that? You get to the end of the story and ah, I knew it! But friends, Figuring out a human mystery is nothing compared to the joy of having the gospel mystery revealed. That God loves you in all of your sinfulness, in all of your forsakenness, in all of your strangeness and apart from Godness, that God in Christ has loved you and has brought you in Christ through the proclamation of the gospel together as one family. 
Oh, may our joy at beholding that mystery never get out of our systems. And may the people around us be so moved that they would ask us, what has gotten into you? What is so exciting? May we have the grace to tell them of the gospel mystery, that God cares, that God has come, that God has made the difference that none of us on our own could have ever accomplished. May we not only be recipients of the gospel mystery, but by God's grace, may we be the messengers of that mystery to others. Let's pray.